Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm the producer over here at Collider Video. And joining me on uh, this weekend for our mailbag shows is the lovely Ma Natasha Martinez. Natasha, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. This Super is your excited. first mailbag. First mailbag show. I'm Reagan, so yeah. glad you're doing it with me. Very glad to be here. Excited. All right. So, hey, listen, for those of you who don't know uh, what this show is, if you've never watched Mailbag before, it's much more laid back, relaxed. We'll talk some behind the scenes stuff as well. And all we do, like I said, is take your mailbag questions. And how do you get a mailbag question? on the show it's simple you just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com maybe you'll see your question pop up on a monday through friday movie talk maybe you'll see it on the weekend we do get over a thousand questions a week so maybe you won't see it at all but we do our best to get your question on the show so with all that out of the way let's get to the first question let's get to it lee curtis writes if snoke is dark darth plagueis do you think there's a chance we will see a flashback to when palpatine killed him and ian mcdermott will reprise his role yeah we have been speculating for Pretty much a year. Ever since we heard that, you know, there was going to be this Supreme Leader Snoke character, that Andy Serkis was going to be in the movies, like, who is he going to play? Blah, blah. We've speculated it's going to be Darth Plagueis. Now, we've had reasons to believe it. There are some things that suggest maybe it's not true. I personally believe that it's going to be Darth Plagueis. May not be. Maybe. If you don't know who Darth Plagueis is, in Revenge of the Sith, uh, when he was still pretending he was just Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, Palpatine told the story about how his former master was a Darth Plagueis the Wise, who is the only Force user ever to learn the secret of how to cheat death. Now, he also says in that story that he killed his master in his sleep, but since he's a dude who can cheat death, it doesn't really matter that he thinks he killed him in his sleep. So it's possible that a Darth Plagueis guy could be around. That would explain why you have, if the Sith were destroyed, in Revenge or uh, Return of the Jedi, if you know the Emperor's killed, Invader's killed, and all that kind of stuff, how is there still a powerful evil Force user around? Well, it would be Plagueis. A thousand other potential options as well. But the question is, if Snoke is indeed Darth Plagueis, is it possible that we could see the great Ian McDermott show up who played Palpatine so well in all the Star Wars films, except for the first one, of course, um, could we see him pop up? I believe the answer to that question is no. I don't think we're going to see a flashback. A flashback is particularly difficult because it's been like 40 years and stuff like that. And it's been a lot of years since we've seen Ian McDermott play Palpatine. And now he would have to pretend that he was like a lot younger than he is now. I think that not impossible. Certainly not impossible with today's makeup and technology. But I have a feeling if, and that's a huge if, if Palpatine, or if uh, uh, Supreme Leader Snoke is indeed Plagueis, I don't think we're going to see Ian McDiarmid pop up. Just my thoughts. Yeah. And there's a ton of speculations, especially with all these Star Wars, Star Wars movies coming up. Yeah. Um, do you think, I know it's all fan-driven, it's all fun, but when it comes to the actual, you know, release date of this movie, does that kind of ruin, like, the special experience of just being in the moment of this great movie and having, like, these expectations maybe not be met? You know what? That It's a, it's a question that comes up a lot because we do this with every movie we're really looking forward to. It's the driving the speculation. I often compare it, I compare movie fandom to sports fandom all the time, right? Mm. And... Think about the Super Bowl for a second. The Super Bowl, once the two teams are established, who the two teams play in the Super Bowl, all, you got two weeks. And all it is for weeks, every day, 24-7 on these sports networks, every single hour is all these experts and all these you know, uh, pundits and all these analysts talking about what might happen. How is this going to break down? Whose defense is going to do this? Will the special teams play? This? And it's just it's wild speculation, wild speculation, wild speculation. But that's the fun of being a fan. Obviously, <laughs> we don't know anything until it comes to g game day. When it comes to Star Wars The Force Awakens, we don't know anything until it comes down to game day but before game day for us it's going to be monday when the force awakening comes <laughs> yes we're very excited about that but until then we are left to speculate and take guesses and theorize and, and, and fantasize about what we might see on that big screen and i know for me as a fan who i've done this since i was 12 years old mm. like wildly speculating about every single movie i was going to see I know not once has it ruined my personal experience. That or was my next question. If you had any film that you were just like, 
God, I wish that they had done what I had imagined. Well, I mean, there are certainly movies that have come and gone that you thought they should have gone in a certain direction and they didn't. And then, but the only thing that determines that, lots of movies we see that we have an expectation. And sometimes they go with our expectations. Sometimes they go in a different direction. And if the movie's a good movie, then we're okay that they didn't go with our expectation. Mm -hmm. If it's a bad movie, then we're disappointed. <laughs> but it's all about whether it's a good or a bad movie, whether or not, because it, it can meet our expectation and be a bad film. Mm -hmm. And then, well, we kind of wish they went a different yeah. direction. So it's all about whether the movie's good or bad. <laughs> all right, what's next? Okay, next, James Fung writes, Hey, Collider guys, keep doing the great work. Recently, they announced Rebecca Ferguson coming back for Mission Impossible 6, which is great. I was thinking that it would be just as great if they brought back some other female team members from previous movies like Paula Patton and Maggie Q to give the team a larger female dynamic for a change. What do you guys think? I really like Paula Patton. Um, when she was in the franchise. I really like Maggie Q when she was. But here's the thing. You've heard me say this all the time. The characters have to serve the story. Mm -hmm. You don't go out and you know, manipulate and change your story just because you want to shove certain characters in there. That's what the Star Wars prequels did. And you know, the results were not very good. If they come up with a story and they say, hey, you know what would really serve this story well? If we had these other characters come in, if these other characters come in to this story, it would really serve the story well, then I am all for it. It would be great. What I think the Mission Impossible, one of the many things the Mission Impossible franchise has done really well up to this point is they've kept the team relatively small. It's a smaller group of characters. It's not like an X-Men universe where you got 45 characters running around. They have kept these Mission Impossible films while they've been grand spectacles if you really sit back and take a look, they've kept them very small at the same time, which I think is really impressive. So what I don't want to see them do is just throw tons and tons of characters in there just for the sake yeah. of having the characters there. If they can serve the story, I'm all for it. Otherwise, eh, I'd say take a pass. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, we had talked about the female protagonist role becoming yeah. a trend in these remake films. Um, and I'm just thinking... If it's just a trend, it's a trend and it's not that exciting anymore. Right. So I don't know. I I mean, I'm all about girl power, but if it does that, I think it just makes it less special. Yeah. I mean, and there's certainly something to be said there. Like if you have the opportunity, and I think we're in a time frame right now where, look, if you have the option and you have an opportunity where you need one or two new characters to serve the story, then Look, this is a male-driven franchise with Tom Cruise. Uh, of course, you got Simon Pegg is now coming back for all these of the movies. We had other male characters coming back again and again. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, and all other things being equal, and you have a choice that's 50-50, bring back one of the other female characters or bring back another one of the male characters, I say put in one of the female characters just to balance it out a bit. But now, if the story calls for one of the former male cast members, then by all means, bring back another male cast member. But if all other things are equal, bring back the female cast member. Totally agree. All right, what's next? <laughs> Matt O'Brien writes, Hi, Collider crew. Love the show and listen and watch to it every day at work. Thank you so much. It's a part of my day that I always look forward to. Recently, the question of what will the mid-credits, end-credits scene be for Civil War, and you guys joked about Thor calling Bruce Banner. <laughs> my question is, though, how is Banner the Hulk going to get to Asgard? I think it would be a great post-credit se credit scene to see what leads him to going to space and ultimately wind up in Asgard and how. Could this require longer than a post-credit scene? Well, let's keep this in mind, too. We don't know that Hulk is going to be on Asgard because I believe when we heard um, the people at Marvel talking about it, they said, I believe they said a planet other than Earth and other than Asgard. So I don't know that we're going to see Hulk in Asgard. But still, your question remains, how the hell does Hulk get into space? Because the last time we saw him, he was just on a plane. I mean, he's on this, this little uh, Quinjet thing that ain't taking him into orbit. So how does he get into space? I'm sure that is something that the, that the, uh, the Thor Ragnarok, the movie itself, will try to answer. Could it be something that happens in either A, a Captain America Civil War post credit scene, or I guess that's really the only option, a like Captain America, or B, a Doctor Strange post credit scene? I don't think so. Because it sounds to me, and I could be wrong here, but it sounds to me that Hulk and Banner getting into space, that's a major plot point. 
That's something that sounds to me has to be a bigger part of the movie than just something you put up in a 20 second um, post credit scene. Like we joked on movie talk about, okay, what happens if Banner gets on the phone and it's or Banner, I need you. And then the <laughs> Bifrost opens up and zoop and he's gone. Okay, that would be funny and everything, <laughs> but it wouldn't serve. It would be, I think it'd be shortchanging the movie and shortchanging mm. the story mm -hmm. because I think you have a much better opportunity to use, you know, that that part of how does you know Banner get to wherever Hulk's going. The Thor seeking out Banner is probably gonna be a part of that movie. I don't know how big or how small, but yes, we're gonna see Hulk get into space, but I don't think it's gonna be in post credit scene because I think it's something that's a little bit bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And speaking of these post credit scenes in the Marvel films, which off the top of your head has been like the one where you're like, yes, I can't wait. Oh, I mean, so many of them have been really good. A couple of them have been kind of boring mm -hmm. in the honors. I think, for me, the two best ones for me so far, one is the first one and one is the most recent one. The first one is in the first Iron Man movie. When Tony comes home and there's Samuel Jackson as Nick Frost saying, we've got something coming up called the Avengers Initiative. It was the first time that we'd heard them say Avengers in the movies and everybody who knew to stick around. Because remember, yeah. when the first Iron Man came out, it wasn't a big trend to have these post credit scenes. So when I went to go see Iron Man, I knew because of the business we're in, I knew there was a post credit scene. I didn't know what it was. And I'm in the theater and I'm watching all these people getting up to leave and I'm like, no, wait, <laughs> there's more. Trust me, there's more. And everybody who was still in the theater and a lot of people had left. Yeah. When when he came on, when Nick Fury came on, on the screen, Samuel Jackson's Nick Fury, and said that, everybody went bananas. And that was a key, important moment mm -hmm. in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. My next favorite one, and there have been many good ones, the shawarma scene at the end of Avengers was so funny and so great, <laughs> but is in Ant-Man, um, when they cut to Captain America and Falcon, they've got Buck. And he's caught there and they're saying, I know a guy. That set up Civil War so great. It got us excited for Civil War. Um, I really didn't like the last one they did in Age of Ultron with Thanos going in and grabbing the Infinity Gauntlet and saying, I'm going to do the job myself. And that was just kind of a waste. But yeah, the very first one with Nick Fury, mm -hmm. the very last one we had with uh, Ant-Man, mm -hmm. uh, those are my favorite ones. Now, when you talk about these people walking out of the theaters, because I have the same feeling whenever I see a post credit scene and people are leaving, I'm like, no, stay, because you're distracting me, I wanna watch. <laughs> but why not just add the post credit scene to the end of the movie? Does does it make it more special? It's, then it's not a post credit scene. Yeah, I know, then it's but something, like. It's something a little bit, it's, it's meant to be, I mean, it was really created as a device, as something special, as mm -hmm. this is the post credit scene. Like, definitively, the movie's over. But, but hang around. around. <laughs> but hang around. And I I would kind of feel, well, I, you know, who wants to sit in a movie theater for three or four minutes longer than you need to? Mm -hmm. But to me, it's it makes it kind of special. Yeah. I like it being where it's at. So I, I wouldn't want them to put it at the end. Yeah. I All agree. right, what's next? Okay, Jake Dis or Jake Silva the fourth says, Dear Collider, Extended Universe, aka DCEU, I love your show. I love the movie Watchmen, the best comic book movie ever made in my opinion. Hmm. Do you think that DCWB could explore of the Watchmen universe, i.e. the Rorschach solo movie, TV series expanding on origins, aftermath of Watchmen, etc.? Um, Watchmen is one of those movies where it's very divisive. That's a very, very divisive movie. There's very few people like me who thought the movie was okay. I thought the movie was okay, but I'm in the minority. Like the vast majority of people either hate that movie or love that movie. Like I know Dennis loves Watchmen. Uh, I know one or two other guys on our crew that love them. I know one or two other guys on our crew that hate it. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle that I thought it was okay. It's a very divisive film. and. It threw a wrench in a lot of movie plans because the Watchmen actually lost Warner Brothers money mm. and it made a lot less than they were hoping it was going to make. And it actually made the studio pull the plug on a couple of projects they had, a couple of R-rated projects they had, they had come up because they thought, look, Watchmen just lost us like $30 million. We're going to pull the plug on it. So it, it's difficult. Then you had some people who were real comic book purists. See, I thought Watchmen was an incredibly faithful adaptation of the graphic novel, which just goes to prove that I think sometimes you shouldn't just faithfully adapt, you need a little bit more adaptation. But 
Uh, but some of the real purists were really mad that you didn't have the multiple tentacle thing at the end and instead they took a different approach. I thought it was the right decision that they made personally. But because of its lukewarm reception, because it was so divisive and there were so many people, despite the fact that there are so many people who love it, there are equally as many people that don't like it, it seems. And the fact that it lost Warner Brothers money, I don't think Warner Brothers is lining up or is in any big hurry to try to revisit that Watchmen universe again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... Let's, all right <laughs> that's all i have to say about that one all what's right. next tony writes hey guys love your show my question is now that it is almost certain that the rights of f4 will revert to marvel in 2022 that's a scary year to think about do you <laughs> think that marvel will immediately begin production for f4 or it will wait for its mcu to reboot since fox has tarnished the brand or start a tv show on abc will it be insulting for f4 to do a netflix tv show Thanks for all the great. Thanks for the great show, and keep it coming. Um, I've said this a few times. I, I'll say it again. Yeah, Marvel may. It's, it's probably going to get Fantastic Four back. I think at some point. I think Fox is just going to say three strikes and you're out. We can't, you know, risk any more on this. We've kind of botched this. But even if they do, I don't see why Marvel would make another Fantastic Four movie. I I just don't. Marvel. It's, this isn't like the Spider-Man situation with Sony, where Spider-Man is one of the world's most popular, like today is one of the world's most popular comic book characters. He's mm -hmm. one of the most beloved comic book characters that everybody who doesn't even read comic books, you go up to somebody and say, hey, do you know who Peter Parker is? They go, everybody who doesn't yeah. even read comics, they say, that's <laughs> Spider-Man. You go up to somebody and say, do you know who Ben Grimm is? Not a lot of people say that's, well, that's the thing. Everybody's in a comic books, Will. They would. So this is a different kind of a situation. Fantastic Four is no longer a property. Look, I used to make this joke, but it's true. More people watch this episode of Mailbag than bought the Fantastic Four comics when the Fantastic Four comics were still being published. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Let that sink in. More people watch Mailbag then bought Fantastic Four. So it's not exactly a property that's demanding to be made. Could they do it? Could they do it well? Of course you can. You can, like you, like I said, you can make a movie about, um, you know, what's his name? Pietro, the, the half-filled bottle of water. You Pietro. Can make <laughs> Pietro, the half-filled bottle of water. You can make a movie about him if you do it right and have a good script and have a good director and have good actors along with it and do everything right, you could. Can they do the, that with Fantastic Four? Absolutely. But the name Fantastic Four right now is a joke. Mm. Thanks to Fox, it's a total joke. They have botched that property so badly. I just don't see, if I'm Marvel, and I have only got the resources to make two or three films a year, why am I wasting my money and my time on trying again to reboot the Fantastic Four when I can make another Miss Marvel film or another Captain America or another Thor or another Ant-Man or, or I've got all these other characters lined mm -hmm. up if I want to explore more with the Inhumans and I want to have multiple Inhumans movies. and I, When there's so many things that are working and working well for Marvel, why would they want to take a beat up, valueless property at this point in the Fantastic Four and make one there? Now, all that being said, I think eventually somebody will take a crack at it again, but between now and 2022, which shockingly isn't even all that far away I anymore. Know. That's why it's um, scary. It's about <laughs> almost 2016 here. Um, between now and 2022, I just don't know why you do it. They got yeah. so many properties that are working, so many properties that are valuable, so many properties that people want to see a movie for. I, I just don't see why they'd waste their time in Fantastic Four. Mm -hmm. And now speaking of like Netflix and Hulu, what's your opinion of these like giant franchise movies going to outlets like that? Well, I mean, th there's there's two different things. One, when, you, when you're looking at, I love it when movies that were in theaters then go there. So I love watching Avengers and whatever on Netflix and Hulu and things like that. But now you've got Marvel entering into this new world of having things like Daredevil, mm -hmm. Jessica Jones, uh, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, The Defenders, you know, and they say they got more plans for that over there. I think it's great. I really do. I think it's wonderful when they've got characters that they think they can tell some good stories with but they can't, we, they don't think they can invest $200 million in and make their money back by putting them in feature films, but they feel like they could, got good stories. They put them on Netflix. They give them a budget of about $41. Because uh, if you watch Daredevil, I love Daredevil, Daredevil, but they made that that show for lunch money. I mean, that <laughs> is, they spent like that, and that goes to prove that you can make great stories without a lot of money. 
um, then I think it's great. It gives them another avenue to tell great stories. They don't have to worry so much about the financial risk. And then they can get us, a lot of people who may not be hardcore comp, look, nobody who's not a hardcore comp book reader had ever heard of Jessica Jones mm -hmm. or had probably ever heard of Luke Cage. But now you give them an outlet to have these stories told, very low budgets, tell great stories, get them out there. I, I think it's a really nice move. Nice. All right, what's next? All right. Sawmasters writes, my question is concerning, Brit concerning British accents in films. Why do British actors have to put on American accents in American films, such as John Boyega having to put an accent on for The Force Awakens or Rafi Spall in Prometheus? I understand if the role requires the actor to be American, but if it doesn't, why do they have to change accents? Um, it's very simple because the characters, are, the, the actors are there to serve the character. And if the writers and producers and director picture a character a certain way, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're American or from Pluto or from Mars. If the writers and the producers and the director picture a character a certain way, and that's whether the way they look, how tall they are, how short they are, what race they are, the color of hair they have, the color of eyes they have, uh, what accent they speak with. They've pictured their character, and now they're gonna go and get the actor who can best fit that. Now, that means if you've got an Australian actor who's got an accent but can perfectly well pull off a straight American English kind of accent, then fine, if they mm -hmm. can embody that role. But you don't go, ah, you know, I just speak in your normal accent. because No, you, you don't do that. Yeah. If you've got somebody playing Mary Jane and you say, you know, we really want her to be a redhead, an actress can't come along and say, well, I just have naturally brunette hair. Let me, just let me keep that hair. No, the character has <laughs> red hair, so put on the damn wig. Um, and so that's really, you don't start changing what the vision was for the character to meet the actor. Now, there are exceptions to that. There are absolutely exceptions to that. But... And we've seen exceptions to that play out. There have been there are many stories in Hollywood of when you know they're thinking one way, then an actor came in and kind of changed their mind about it. That happens, but it's rare. It doesn't happen all that often. And I'm totally fine when a writer and a producer and a director want to do that. But for the most part, these guys have their vision for a character, and usually they've been working on developing this movie for three or four years before they even cast. So they've had this character in their head for three or four years. They're not just like, oh, you got a little bit of a different accent? Ah, just go ahead and do your accent. Yeah. They're not gonna do that. So you, the actors, morph themselves physically, intellectually, mentally, spiritually, and accent-wise, you morph yourself into that character however the producer wants it to be. Now, I don't know if you can think of it, this at the top of your head, but worst accent portrayal in a movie. Oh, <laughs> you know what? There, okay, uh, Keanu Reeves in <laughs> Bram Stoker's Dracula. I think Dennis and I have talked about that one many times. Uh, that was terrible. I just saw a movie I liked, uh -huh. uh, which is um, In the Heart of the Sea. And I am a big fan Big, big fan of Chris Hemsworth. I yeah. think he's a terrific thespian. If you haven't seen Rush, watch him in Rush. He's terrific in it. I think he's a wonderful actor. But here's this big Aussie dude who's trying to not only pull off an American accent, which he often does well, but like this um, 1800s Nantucket mm. accent. And it, Dennis, I don't know if, if you agree with this or not, but I found that Hemsworth kept floating back and no pun intended, floating <laughs> back and forth between a little bit of when he would start to raise his voice, you really start to mm. hear the Aussie in a little bit to sometimes he forgot he wasn't Thor. So he had a little bit of Thor and then sometimes do a little bit of a bad Nantucket and then sometimes straight American. And it just wasn't the, uh, the greatest job. Another film that I really like um, that the accent was all over the place, was Robin Hood with uh, Kevin Costner. Mm. I love, one of the greatest songs in a movie ever, Brian Adams, Everything I Do, I Do It For You, fantastic song. Everything, anyway, so, <laughs> um, but, and I, and I love that movie, but oh my God, Kevin Costner's accent was some, just a, mo, a lot of times straight American, then sometimes he's like, I think today I'll try the English accent, and then sometimes he's got this bad English accent, and whatever, so, yeah, those are just some, I'm sure, I want to know what you guys think. What are some of the worst 
faked accents you've ever heard in a movie where they're supposed to trying to be serious and do it jump in the comments let me know what you think i'd love to hear your opinion all right what's next <laughs> okay jamie rye writes hey collider crew viewer from the uk here loving the show and have made your movie talk a part of my daily routine oh, thanks now. so much jamie i was wondering what you all think will be 2016's highest grossing movie my money is on civil war as it's marvel of course other than that i think it will be a close call with Batman vs. Superman, Apocalypse, Suicide Squad, Rogue One, and possibly even Finding Dory. What do you think? And always keep up the good work. Yeah, don't underestimate Finding Dory. Don't underestimate that film for two I'm reasons. I'm so excited. <laughs> One, it's a Pixar film. Now you might say, well, John, The Good Dinosaur is a Pixar film, so I just, yeah, yeah, but that was a movie that had a lot of drama, it was pushed over a year. They scrapped it, built it again from scratch, and did very little marketing for it to come out. Um, so don't, and it still ended up being a pretty good movie. I, I really liked Good Dinosaur. Finding Dory, uh, well, first of all, Finding Nemo is a beloved Pixar film. My favorite, films. my favorite. We did recently a top 10 Pixar films of all time list. And while it did not come in at the top of our list, in discussion with a lot of people, like there's a lot of people that is their all time favorite Pixar mm -hmm. film. People love this. And now you got people who are relatively young when that movie came out that have kids of their own now. And they're going to go because they're going to want to see this again. And they're going to want to bring their kids to it and all that kind of stuff. There's an emotional attachment to the film. Don't underestimate it. Now, having said that, I'm going to go out on a limb. I've been saying this all along. I'm still going to stick to it. And it's going to be Batman versus Superman will be the number one film at the box office this year. Why? Because we've had a lot of Marvel films and many of them are great. And I know, I know that Civil War is going to be awesome. That being said, Batman versus Superman, and you've heard me say this a lot, is a film that a lot of idiots like me have been waiting for decades to see. We have never seen the two greatest superheroes of all time, Superman, Batman. We've never seen them on a movie screen at the same time together, which is insane when you think about the history of these characters, how long they've been around and how important they are to the pantheon of comic book heroes and pop culture. It's insane. And now we finally are going to get it. That first Comic-Con trailer was astounding. It's still my number one trailer of the year. The last trailer they put out is not so good. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, now, it then depends, though, on how good or bad the movies are. If Civil War and Batman versus Superman are equal, say they're both 8 out of 10s, then Batman versus Superman wins the box office 2016. If Captain America Civil War is a little bit better than Batman versus Superman, it's an 8.5, you know, Batman versus Superman, let's say, is a 7.5. Batman versus Superman wins the box office. But if Captain America Civil War turns in like a nine, nine and a half, and a Batman versus Superman pulls in a six or a six and a half out of 10, then word of mouth and repeat viewings and you know people like you and me having seen the film and then you didn't see it, well, come mm -hmm. on, we gotta go. And then yeah. they're dragging their other friends to come see it. That will push, uh, I believe it will push uh, Captain America Civil War ahead. Now, some people, some of you guys might be wondering, well, John, there's a Star Wars movie coming out in 2016. <laughs> Rogue One, yes, but these anthology films are wild cards. We've never had a Star Wars anthology film before. Rogue One is not a part of the ongoing episodic story of Star Wars. You know, we've got Star Wars Episode 4, 5, 6, and now 7. In 2017, we'll have Episode 8. In 2019, we'll have Episode 9. This is outside of that. We've never had that before. So I think Rogue One will do very well, but I think... Finding Dory, I think Batman v Superman, and I think Captain America Civil War will all do better. And then just under that, I believe uh, Suicide Squad will also do quite well. So mm -hmm. my pick right now, while having not seen any of these movies, so I, I might I reserve the right to change my pick later after <laughs> starting to see them, but my pick right now is going to be Batman v Superman will be the box office champion of 2016. Now, out of all these highly anticipated films coming out in 2016, which one do you think will be your favorite, not necessarily the most successful? Okay, again, ha hard to answer because I haven't seen them, yeah. but if I, if I gotta take a wild guess, and this is just pure speculation, which one do I think will be my favorite out of these? I'm guessing <laughs> it's between Rogue One and Captain America Civil War mm -hmm. because I loved Captain America Winter Soldier. The last Captain America movie was outstanding. 
Um, and it's being directed, this new one's being directed by the Russo brothers again. And the new trailer looks fantastic. And I've seen nothing from Rogue One yet. So for now, for now, I'm going to say my guess is that Captain America Civil War will be my favorite movie of 2016. But ask me again once I see my first trailer for Rogue One because that could very well change. Mm -hmm. All right, last question of the day. All right, a fan writes, salutations from Saskatoon, Canada. I lived in Saskatoon for a while. How you doing? I love saying that, Saskatoon. I'm going to Star Wars on the 18th with reserved seating. Nice. But I can't wait and want to follow in John's footsteps on the 17th and do a wait in line non-reserved seating pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how you were going to feel when you attend the premiere at the Chinese Theater? What will you be thinking, doing, feeling? Thanks so much. You know what? When Star Wars The Phantom Menace was coming out, um, I this is how important it was to me. <laughs> I was living in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada at the time. And I wanted to see The Phantom Menace at my favorite movie theater, which was 2,000 miles away in, uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, which was really is my home. And so me and some friends, we rented a, a minivan and we drove across the country to go to Hamilton so I could watch The Phantom Menace on the big screen there. But I wanted that pilgrimage experience. I wanted the experience of camping out in line. So I did the ridiculous. In, you gotta understand, Saskatoon, how far north of Saskatoon, you can see the Aurora Borealis there at night. So you can see the Northern Lights at wow. night, which is gorgeous and beautiful. Yeah. It can get cold in Saskatoon, let me tell you. <laughs> so before I left to go out east and watch The Phantom Menace there, I had friends who were camping out on the sidewalks for, I think it was four days. Mm -hmm. um, they had a little tent, tent set up, lots of people. It was like a shanty town. I mean, they had <laughs> tents set up and everything. And I went and I camped out with them. Even though I wasn't getting tickets, even though I was not going to be watching the movie there, I wanted to make camping out on a sidewalk a part of my experience. So you didn't, you didn't watch it. You just went for the experience of being outside the theater. Yeah, because once my buddies got cold. there, yeah, it was very cold. <laughs> once my friends got their tickets, I already had my tickets for out east. I was in this line at a movie theater that I wasn't there to see the movie for, all that kind of stuff. And then I drove across the country for opening night oh my on gosh. the East Coast. So um, what am I going to be feeling going to the premiere, the actual premiere? Now, look, I have been to a Star Wars premiere before, but that was that little... A lot of people forget, Star Wars put out an animated movie a few years ago, Star Wars Clone Wars. Mm. That movie was awful. I mean, it sucked. And it was at this little theater in Hollywood called The Egyptian. It's a very cool theater, but a little theater. And George Lucas was there and I hated the movie, but it didn't ever felt like a real Star Wars premiere to me. Going to The Force Awakens and made all the more special by the fact that I have um, Tiffany Smith and Mark and Christian all coming with me as well. We got a limo. We're going to drive down there in style, have a good time. Um, I can't even begin to tell you because Star Wars to me, I've, I've mentioned this on uh, Jedi Council the other day, it is my earliest childhood memory is my mom watching Star Wars with me. And I have mm. no other memory for another two or three years after that. I mean, that's my earliest memory. Wow. One of my next earliest memories was my Aunt Pina taking me to see The Empire Strikes Back, the second film. Um, and, it, and as a child, seeing the images as this brand new film, Star Wars, that r completely birthed in the Hollywood blockbuster era. There had never been anything like this. There had never been a movie that came along and completely swept all of pop culture the way Star Wars did at the time. And as a kid, seeing on the TV screen those iconic images of the Man's Chinese Theater, although I was, it was called the Grommans, I think. I, I, no, it was Man's at first. It was the Man's Chinese Theater at first. And watching the, the crowds and seeing footage and pictures of that first premiere, to know that I'm going down there now to be a part of that is, I would give up everything else I have for it. I mean, I would give up this job. I wouldn't give up my wife, but I would give <laughs> up this job. I would give up um, any toys. I, I would give it all up to be there and be a part of that. It has literally been, I don't know that's sad because we're talking about a movie, but it has literally been one of the very few items on my bucket list. And mm. uh, I, I, I just, 
I can't put it into words. So we're going to be videoing, probably using our Instagram a lot. When we go down there, we're going to go down to the premiere probably about an hour and a half early. If you're not following us on Instagram yet, follow us on Instagram. We're Collider Video, all one word on Instagram. Make sure you're following us because we're going to be putting up video on Instagram, the 15 second videos, like right up to the moment we walk in the doors to go see the movie. Then right when we walk out, we'll, we'll Instagram some more. Then we're coming right back here to the studio to shoot a review. Ugh. Watch for that late Monday night. It's going to be amazing. All right. Now, serious question. Will you right. cry? Yep. I have cried. I appreciate three, the honesty. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to cry. I'm absolutely going to cry when, when I'm there and that music starts yes. and where Star Wars appears and the opening crawl comes. I have, I've cried in three movies in my life. If I'm remembering correctly, mm -hmm. it might've been four, but I think it was three. I cried near the end of Life is Beautiful with Roberto Benigni. And how you're, could you're, you not? Yeah, you're just not a you human not? being. You're yeah. not alive if, yeah. you haven't, if you didn't cry at the end of that movie. <laughs> uh, I cried in, I might have cried in Amelie, um, but one of the other ones is uh, I cried at the end of my best friend's wedding and I'm not going to tell, I know this sounds like a weird <laughs> one to cry in, but I will tell that story another time. But so yes, I am absolutely going to cry. Well, I am very excited for you and I can't wait to follow everything. I wish I was there too. <laughs> I can't wait. I wish you could come as well. And I wish all of you guys could be there. So listen, that'll do it for us for this installment of Mailbag. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, stop what you're doing. Click the subscribe button. Become a subscriber of our videos here on YouTube. It'll keep you up to date on all of our shows that we do, the mailbags, Jedi Council, Heroes, Movie Talk, all the special editorials we have up right now. We've got, we just put up a new editorial the other day on the top 10 actors who almost played major superhero roles. You'll want to check that out. It's a really interesting list, so check that out there. So make sure you subscribe and click the thumbs up button on this video as well. I want to thank... Her very first time here on Mailbag, Natasha <laughs> Martinez. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, Natasha, where can people find you online? You guys can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. And you can simply follow me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter at John Campion. Once again, don't forget, stop what you're doing and go and follow us on Instagram as well, simply at Collider Video. So special thanks to Dennis behind the camera for making it all work. And thanks to you guys. Make sure you jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts on any or all of the questions that we addressed here today. That'll do it for us. Thanks for joining us. And until tomorrow, bye-bye.